Malcolm X, the prominent black nationalist leader, wasn't afraid of blunt words. If you're black, you should be thinking black. And if you're not thinking black at this late stage, he said, I'm sorry for you. So what does it mean to think black? And what shape should black radical politics take in 2018? In his new book, Back to Black, Retelling Black Radicalism for the 21st Century, the author and academic, Kahinde Andrews, argues that racism is embedded in the fabric of society that the welfare of African Americans actually declined under the Obama presidency and that without revolutionary change, no real progress can be made. He joins me now. Gahinde, nice to talk to you. What does black radicalism insist on at its, at its core? Well, there's two things. One is the unity of all people of African descent, both in the Af in African continent and across the diaspora. And the second one is understanding that racism is in the DNA of this system and no reform or no legislation can change that and nothing short of revolution can bring freedom to so black when, people. So when you say racism, do you mean the historic um, happenings, if you like? Of, yeah, not, of, and not of, just history. I mean, white supremacy is based on the idea that black people are at the bottom are subhuman and white people are at the top are the richest. And that is what the global economy looks like today. It's still with us today. You've picked out three examples I know that you want to take us through, defining moments in the history of black nationalism. And the first I think we're going to have a look at is the uh, liberation of Haiti in 1791. Why was that so critical? Well, so Haiti is really important. So the revolution starts in 1791, but isn't completed until 1804. And it's the only successful slave rebellion in history. And now Haiti is important because the brutality of Haiti meant that they basically worked people to death and a large amount of these enslaved were, were born free and they hadn't become accustomed to slavery and they threw off the shackles of slavery and they threw off the French, their French masters. And actually it's this resistance which starts the end of the slave trade, not morality of Britain or anywhere like that. So why didn't it catch on then? I mean, if they were the first and it was, over, it, was, it was overthrown, what happened? Well, this is the problem of revolution in one country. Haiti is one of the poorest countries today precisely because it had that revolution, surrounded by America, the Caribbean, the British Empire, the French Empire. They basically punished Haiti, uh, until the, and that, that legacy is still with us today. You also talk about Pan-Africanism a lot in the book. Now, that's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a sort of a complicated concept, that, which is the, what, the idea of, of the unity of Africa yeah. as a as a continent. Yeah, so the idea basically is that African people have, if you unify the African continent, if you unify the African diaspora, and if Africa can use its resources effectively, and then that is one of the ways in which you can have, um, take, take us out of this system in a sense. But it also includes this um, really controversial idea of repatriation, if you like, a kind of returning of blacks to Africa as if it's the homeland. Now, that has a very strong well, racist I mean, overturn. Yeah, so this is the, fifth, the pictures you've seen of the Fifth Pan-African Congress, which actually don't make that kind of return. So Garveyism is this kind of politics that says, it starts a black star line in the 20s and says, let's actually take all black people back to Africa. The Fifth Pan-African Congress is a bit more liberal in a sense. This um, is the one that was in Manchester. In Manchester in, in, 19, in 1945. Yeah. I mean, Britain's a really important site of Pan-Africanism because as empire, it was a place that brought together people like Jomo Kenyatta from Kenya and Kwame Nkrumah from Ghana, who led the decolonial struggle. And the figure who maybe sits at the pinnacle of, of modern black radicalism is Malcolm X, right? 1960s was the sort of the era that we think of as the, the birth of the civil rights movement. Yeah. Now, um, this is a quote, we formed an organization to fight whoever gets in our way, bring about the complete independence of people of African descent. And he says, bring about the freedom of these people by any means necessary. Now that's often taken to mean violence, right? Well, I think one of the things that Malcolm is, is recognising here is that this system is the most violent that's ever existed. The West has killed far more people than anything else. It's sort of naive to expect you could get freedom from the West without violence. But the bigger part of that quote is the organisation of Afro-American Unity, which is started in 64. And actually, this book isn't theoretical. We started the Harambee Organisation of Black Unity on the same principle. It says actually what we need is not violence or guns. Mm. It's to organise ourselves on the grassroots, on the local level, on the national level, on the international level, so that we actually mobilise the power that we have as a people which for far too long has been used and abused. And you think that can be done just through organisations? I mean, you know, the, you're not talking about the Boy Scouts here, right? No, you're not talking about something where people start off holding hands in one community and, and you've overthrown right. um, Western liberalism and colonialism sort of no, five but what, years but, the, but the key thing is, 100 years ago, you had the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which had 5 million members across 54 countries. It's possible to build this organisation, and that's the only way, really. And what does that look like? I mean, who is in charge? Who leads? 
Is it a reversal? You know, what no, I mean, I definitely not. I think one of the things you have to say is that the principles of this, this is what makes radicalism radical and not extreme, is that the fundamental principles of this society are wrong. They, 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 they cannot stand and we have to have a new principles. And I can't say it's going to look exactly like this, but it definitely won't look like what we have now. Yeah. And it's about bringing the grassroots, the poorest of us together to, to make fundamental change to the system. You talk about repatriation, uh, sorry, not about repatriation, about reparation mm -hmm. in terms of the money that could be paved paid back um, to black people f from, from slavery, from colonialism. I, yeah. is, that, is that actually espoused by anyone now? I mean, well, so no, reparations is a big campaign by CARICOM, by people in the UK have been campaigning on reparations. And the logic of reparations is oh, you can't argue against it. There's a debt that's paid of 300 years. Even if you look at in Africa, there's a debt as well from colonial exploitation. The mm -hmm. problem with reparations is if you add up this money, it's so much it would probably destroy. Because you think you think so much money, right? Continents were built on the back I mean, of slavery. Yeah, Britain right. was built on it. Everything, everything we have today is built on the back of racism and slavery. So to actually transfer that wealth, that would actually be revolutionary. And that's what reparations should be a reminder of is that we another quote from Malcolm X that, that we can never have freedom, justice, and equality within the system. It was just not meant to do it in the same way that a chicken was never meant to lay a duck egg. It's just not possible. Right? Where do you start? How far back with history do you go? I mean, how you could look at, at any people that had been enslaved or mm. any genocide that had happened and say, we've, we've got to overturn that, we've got to no, make... No, because this, we have, this, the West is built on racism. The principle of white supremacy is embedded into our political economy. This isn't something that happened in the past. This is something that happens today. Mm. There's a reason that children die by the second on the African continent. And that's why it still lives with us, and that's why we have to have a total and utter revolution, and we can't have any change within you, this. You, in your book, you point the finger at Obama, uh, and you say, actually, he did less to help black people in America than... Yeah, no, else. I actually got, I got, got, got in trouble from my mum, actually, for saying that Donald Trump is probably a better president for black people than uh, Barack Obama. And again, it's a Malcolm X quote where he says, beware the northern fox who comes smiling and says that things are better. And that's Obama, right? The things have changed. Th we've got a black president now. But you know that, that African-American unemployment went down at the end of the Obama and years. Unemployment went down, but poverty went up because it's the, what kind of jobs is it that people were getting? 50% of all black people who are employed in New York. So he did more York, harm than good in your... 50% of all black people who are employed in New York work in fast food restaurants. That's not no kind of work. Obama could only do harm. The president could only do harm to black people. And at least Trump reminds us, the Southern Wolf, that the president is not your friend. And that's what we need to understand, that we need to organize ourselves collectively and not rely on these institutions which oppress us. Kendi, it's great to talk to you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you.